evening and welcome once more to the Royal Institution for the last of this series on the nature of things. What is a crystal? When we think of a crystal, we generally think of small transparent objects with regular faces, perhaps like the little crystals of quartz we often find in certain kinds of gravel. Here is quite a large crystal of quartz. Here is another one, rather more shapely, which perhaps you can recognize as being like the little crystals that you find in the, in the, in the gravel. But this outside shape can't be everything. Here are some little crystals, rather poor little things they look, yet these are worth 4,500 pounds. They're raw diamonds. And then again, we know those glass things you see in chandeliers. They've got regular faces. They're transparent. But glass isn't crystalline. They're not crystals. So what is it really that makes a thing a crystal? It's its inside arrangement. It's the fact that the molecules or atoms in it are in an absolutely regular pattern, like soldiers on parade or like the pattern of a wallpaper. And I'm just going to illustrate that with an experiment here. Here is a rather lovely crystal of alum, a beautifully regular one with a top rather like a pyramid. Now, this experiment which I should like to show I owe to Professor Burnell, who invented it, who kindly said I might show it tonight. Suppose we take a lot of glass marbles, and I pour them into a quite irregular base like that. There's no pattern about them at all. They lie just anyhow. But suppose, on the other hand, we start them right. Give them a good example, as it were. I have here a base which I filled with marbles, and you see it already, just because the base is the right shape, these little marbles are trying to take up a regular pattern. And if I'm cunning and continue to pour marbles on here, I hope I'll show you a crystal growth. I always feel very nervous when I do this experiment, it needs a steady hand to get it just right. If I hold my hand there, it's merely to stop marbles flying all over the floor, not because I'm helping to shape this crystal. You see it coming? You got a few more on there. Now I think a very steady hand indeed. Now I've got no more marbles. I must pick one up. And now I think you see a little crystal of alum has been made exactly like the one we were trying to copy. Here's another property of crystals which I'd like to show you. A piece of glass is not crystalline, we've said. And therefore, if we try to break a piece of glass, there's no reason why it should break in any particular direction. If I give that a tap and break it, it just breaks anyhow, doesn't it? But if I take a crystal, a crystal of rock salt, and cunningly give that a nick in just the right direction, you see how beautifully it breaks, absolutely regularly, and we can go on carving it up into cubical way forever. There it goes again, you see. Actually, diamond also breaks, cleaves in the same way, and diamond cutters use this property when they want to shape a diamond in the right way. This is a model of the Cullinan diamond, the great Cullinan diamond. And when I was in South Africa, I met Cullinan's son, who told me about the cleaving of this diamond. It was to be cleaved into three pieces to make it the right shape for the diamonds they wanted to get out of it. And 
this man studied it. It was handed over to one of the great diamond cutters in Amsterdam. And he studied it for three weeks to know exactly how he should make his knocks to get his three pieces. He then took up his implements, got ready to strike, and fainted clean away. <laughs> when he came to, he said he just couldn't do it. But his son said, so Mr. Cullinan told me, the honour of the family, father, you must do it. He did it, and it was cleaved in three pieces, and this is the result of one of the largest pieces. Now, gemstones are crystals. Uh, gemstones, as they're found in nature, are not regular and beautiful generally. They're rather odd-looking objects, as you saw with those diamonds. But regular faces are cut in them by the jeweller to bring out their full beauty. Now, what must a gemstone be to show its full beauty? First of all, it must be transparent. Then, it must have a colour and a sparkle, a colour or a sparkle, if possible, both. Those are things we can understand naturally. But there's one further property a gemstone must have that perhaps isn't quite so obvious. It must be hard. Mineralogists rank minerals, and gemstones are, of course, minerals. Mineralogists rank minerals in hardness by a scale. They have a series of standard substances, each one harder than the next. Or if we start at the soft end, each one next up the scale can scratch the one before it. It's a kind of scratching order, rather like the picking order of hens in a fowl yard. Now, here is a selection of these minerals. They start with talc, r uh, over there, the softest of them all. Uh, then, as we go along the scale, we come to number five. That's a mineral called apatite there, which, strangely enough, uh, is the stuff which our teeth are made of. And then, uh, at the end of that row, I think, is topaz, which is getting pretty hard. Then there's the next but hardest of all, that one down at the bottom, which Mr. Coates pointed to, corundum, or ruby, or emerald, or emery powder. They're all the same. Uh, 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 ruby or sapphire, or emery powder. They're all the same. And finally, the hardest of all, a diamond. There is quite a large diamond. These are so arranged that each scratches the next. For instance, this one scratches that, that scratches that. Talc is the stuff we use for baby powder. Babies, apparently, are slightly more than one on the hardness scale. <laughs> now, uh, on the other side here, I've got a set of gemstones. And this is the interesting thing. There are only about ten different kinds of gemstones. We owe these to the kindness of Mrs. Asprey, who have often been our friends in the past and lent us uh, lovely things for these demonstrations. They're nearly all here. Peridot, tourmaline, zircon, aquamarine, and emeralds go with that, topaz, chrysoberyl, sapphire, and ruby, and finally, two diamonds, two lovely diamonds. That square one there is actually worth, I am told, about 12,000 pounds. Now the hardness. That one's number seven, number ten, and I've arranged them in order of hardness again. All of them are harder than seven. Why? This is the sinner that's responsible for it. Quartz, or silica, has a hardness of about seven, and, unless a thing is harder than that, it's scratched by the dust. And when you think of all the stones in nature which are harder than that, have a lovely colour, sparkle and so on, you only have these ten gemstones, and that's why they are the gemstones. Over here, I have a wonderful display that Mrs. Asprey lent for this occasion of these lovely stones made up into various forms of jewellery. It's turning round now, I think, and you can see some of these wonderful objects. One little property, perhaps it's rather amusing to demonstrate, a property of a gemstone which shows that it's really a crystal. Some of these sapphires, this sapphire here is one of them, 
are called star sapphires. That is to say that when you look at a bright light, you see a kind of star, and as you move the sapphire, it floats about in the star. May I just show you how that comes about? It's due to tiny impurities inside the sapphire, little needles and of, in, of some other crystal. These little needles, because of the regular crystalline structure of the sapphire, are arranged in, say, up and down, right to left, and left to right, in a sort of threefold way. Well, we'll make a star sapphire. Mr. Coates here has a sheet of glass. There's a light behind it. You see nothing very special there. But now if I put in some little impurities in the three directions, little pre uh, uh, needles of crystal, as it were, with my distemper brush here, I think you'll see we'll turn this into a very nice star sapphire. Because my little scratches here scatter the light in just the same way that the little inclusions do in the sapphire. Now, if Mr. Coates holds that up, I hope you can see we've turned it into a star sapphire. And finally, diamond. Why do we value a diamond so? It's got no colour, generally. It's just a transparent little crystal. As you know, we value it so because it sparkles. Let's just illustrate the extraordinary property of a diamond the sparkly. I've got a little spot of light coming through that hole, and Mr. Coates will hold in front of that spot of light, first of all, a paste crystal, one of glass, and we'll see the effect of the light being reflected back by it. He will then hold in front of it one of these lovely little diamonds, a brilliant this time, which, we, uh, which I was demonstrating there. Here's the paste now first. You see some sparkle coming on the screen, but nothing very striking. Now, please, we'll have the real <laughs> diamond. You see the difference? Very striking. Now, why? And my last two little experiments will just be an attempt to illustrate why a diamond sparkles. Because, of course, it's that which makes it so highly prized. I've got here a beam of light <coughs> coming from this lantern into this water. You perhaps know what's called the refraction of light. When light comes up and out of the water, it's bent, just as a stick is bent when you hold it in water. <coughs> and the more we bend down the light here, the more it bends down there. And if I turn this round so as to make the light bend down more and more, you see it coming down, when this light here is trying to go parallel to the water, when it's so bent down as much as that, suddenly it can't get out at all. It's all reflected inside, and you'll see the light suddenly brighten up inside. You see it? Now, there it comes out again. Now, perhaps you can understand that the more the light is bent coming out of the water, the greater the angle at which that total reflection inside will take place. Because it takes place directly the light has been so much that it can no longer get outside at all. Diamond bends light about twice as much as water. An extraordinarily high refractive index. Now perhaps you'll begin to see what I'm driving at. Diamonds are cut as brilliance, <coughs> as little stones with a very pointed back as you'll see if you look at the back of a diamond in a ring. It looks the most wasteful way to cut one. One wonders why so much of the diamond has been wasted in making that point at the back. But it's done in order to make the diamond sparkle. And my last little experiment just illustrates that. Here we've got two models. One is supposed to be a paste stone, this one here on my right. One is supposed to be a diamond. Remember that in the paste stone, which, like the water here, has a very poor bending power for light, the light easily gets out at quite a, an ordinary angle. In the diamond, it only gets out if it's falling almost directly on a face, any other angle, and back it goes. And these angles, this model of a brilliant, are all cunningly cut so that if a ray once gets in the top of the diamond, 
it's reflected round inside till it comes out of the top again. It simply can't do anything else. And that's why it sparkles so. <coughs> Let me just illustrate that. Do you see how much this ray gets out? You can see it's sort of shining, I think, on the bottom of the little stand. It gets out quite easily, doesn't it? But now I've simulated a diamond. I wish I could have had one this size. I've simulated a diamond here uh, by increasing the reflecting power very much. And you see now, nothing comes out the bottom. It all has to come out either out of the top or out of the little uh, sides on either side there. <laughs> that is why you ladies, you must remember that your diamonds sparkle not from the front but from the back. And if you let their backs get dirty, your diamond will cease to give its real power and brilliance. It's the little dirt and grease and dust at the back which makes a diamond uh, makes a diamond lose its, 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 its brilliancy and it's the back that always ought to be cleaned. Well, that is the last of my experiments. In conclusion, I'd like uh, to thank the staff of the Royal Institution, which has worked so nobly to prepare all these experiments and to demonstrate them, and the staff of the BBC, which with such patience and skill has arranged its cameras to see what we are trying to show. And to my viewers, I'd like to say that I hope I've succeeded in my aim of showing you what a deep interest there is in the science of everyday 